Well, it's good to see you all this morning, and we're going to go ahead and get underway here this morning. Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. We're going to sing glorify thy name. Let's all stand together and see the words behind me. All righty. Father, we love you, we worship and adore you, glorify thy name in all the earth, glorify thy name, glorify thy name. Good to have you here this morning. We had a great service at the 930 service, and I'm looking forward to hearing Brother Ferris preach again. And so uh, you pray for him as he comes here in a little bit and preaches for us. And uh, let's look first at our verse of the week, and then we'll have prayer time together. And so we're looking at Psalm 150 and verse 6. There in your bulletin or on the screen behind me, and let's say the verse together, and let's begin. Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Psalm 150, verse 6, tremendous verse. So we started this way in the service this morning. I'll just take a moment. Anyone have a praise this morning? You want to praise the Lord for something maybe he's done this week or recently? Anyone at all? We won't take long for this. Brother Jeff. Praise the Lord. Yeah, praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord for problems. Praise the Lord for trials where God can continually prove himself. And he does. Yes. Continually does. Anyone else? John? Amen. Amen. Did I see somebody else? Diane. Lord, you guys have seen some big answers to prayer in your family. Praise the Lord for that. Well, I praise the Lord. My wife doesn't have COVID. Amen. I really do. I'm grateful to the Lord for that. Thank you for praying for Debbie. I really do appreciate that. Well, let's do this. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. And Brother Ferris, I'm going to write down your neighbor's name because I'm going to forget again. So Steve and Char Kramer, this is uh, Brother Ferris and Kim's neighbor. They've been witnessing to them for a number of years, and uh, they've come close to following the Lord as Savior, but have not quite come to that point. But uh, Steve's mom passed away, and she, she was born again. And so 
the desire is obviously for comfort for Steve and Char, but also that God would use this to be that, you know, the Bible says God turns a curse into a blessing and just pray that God will use that. Leslie? Yes. Okay, so she did pass away. Okay, yeah, uh, talked to Dee yesterday and her sister Jeanette uh, was near this, so apparently she must have passed away. Okay, all right, so be in prayer for Dee and uh, be in prayer for Anera. Anera's been here at different times, her niece, a very godly lady and uh, loves the Lord. And, and Jeanette was saved. She knew Christ as her Savior, so we praise the Lord for that. But still, you know, you lose someone, doesn't matter if they're saved and in heaven, you still miss them. And uh, uh, Dee's experienced that a few times here in the last years with some of her siblings. So pray for Dee Watson and then pray for the Kramer family as well. Uh, did I see another hand up? Okay, well, let's go ahead and let's go to, to the Lord in prayer. John, I'm going to have you come to the pulpit and lead us in prayer for the Kramer family and for the Watsons. And just pray for Brother Ferris that God would use him in a good way in the preaching today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we do come this morning, Lord, to glorify your name. We give you all glory, honor, power, and praise, Lord. It's wor you're worthy of it, and we thank you for what you've done for us this morning, Lord. And God, we just humbly come before you asking that you'd meet with us today, that you'd anoint Pastor her Brother Ferris, and uh, use him, Lord, um, to say exactly what you'd have him to say. Lord, I pray, God, that you work on my heart and the hearts of my brothers and sisters, Lord, that you show us areas that we need um, correction in, Lord, areas that we need edification in, and Lord, that you'd open our eyes that we can see you, and God, that the Holy Spirit would move. Lord, bless his ministry, use him, and God, I pray that you make provision for him and his wife and his ministry. We're thankful that he's here this morning, Lord, you bless him. And God, uh, we pray for the Kramer family and the loss. God, we, we're thankful that th this person was saved and then someday we'll be reunited with him in heaven, Lord. I pray, God, that you be with his children, um, the Kramer children, Lord, that you would work in their lives, Lord, that through this, God, that you would be glorified, that um, these these dear souls would understand that you died for them and love them, Lord, that they would understand uh, um, that you care about them, Lord, that you want to save them. And I pray, God, that you'll use the Pharisees and that family continuously, Lord, uh, to be a, a reflection of you. We pray for Miss D and her family right now, Lord. I know it's a grievous time, Lord, and, but God, would you reach, reach down and show comfort, Lord, to meet with them in areas that they need met with, Lord. And I ask God that you'd show your mercy and grace. And we pray for the the families of this church, Lord, that you would hedge us in, God, that you would give us protection, that you would um, work in us, Lord. Thank you for protecting Miss Debbie, that she didn't have COVID. We ask God that you touch her from the ailment that she did have. I pray that you continue to bless Chris and protect him. And Lord, we ask that you would just bless all the brothers and sisters here. Be the pastor, give him wisdom, knowledge, how to lead. God, we thank you for this day. It's a beautiful day, Lord, and everything's growing and blooming. It reminds us of your great resurrection. And Lord, we thank you for this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again. We're going to sing grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt yonder on Calvary's mount of glory there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled grace grace God's grace grace that will pardon and
seated and Paul's going to come with announcements. Good morning. If you are happy to be here, let's get that hand way up in the air. And if you're happy for God's grace, yes. we're going to get that other hand up in the air. And while we have our hands in the air, all God's people said, praise, praise the Lord. Lord. We have uh, several announcements here this morning. First of all, this evening at 5 o'clock, we're going to start our small group Bible study hour. We're going to be meeting up here in the auditorium, then breaking out into small groups. And this is a great opportunity for fellowship, for learning. Uh, just, you know, Jesus taught in small groups. And, and so this is what we're doing. So this is going to be a great time. It's 5 o'clock this evening. So please don't miss that. Wednesday, of course, we have our midweek service at 7 o'clock. We do have something for the adults, the teens over here, and the children downstairs. Now, April the 28th through May the 1st is our missions conference. And we have a lot of guest speakers that are scheduled to come. And it's going to be a great time. You know, when we have the Great Commission, sometimes we can't go, but we can send others. So that's, that's what mission program and our missions conference is all about, to soften our hearts. So please pray about that. Also, on May the 2nd, there's going to be a men's golf outing and a ladies' brunch and shopping outing. And that's going to be planned for our guest missionaries, their spouses, and also for the church family. If you want to come out and, and be involved in that, it's, it's actually a great way to, to get to know our missionaries. And that's important because if you get to know them, you'll know what their needs are. You'll know how to pray for them. So, And if you would like to sponsor a missionary, please see Pastor on that. So that's going to be a great time. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer for that. There is also a sign-up sheet for Daily Vacation Bible School, which kind of sneaks up on us at times. It's June the 21st through the 25th. And we have a lot of, lot of people, a lot of uh, people have volunteered. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer so you could plug yourself in. And you could plug yourself into more than one responsibility for that. So that's going to be, that's a great outreach ministry, and we're planning on that. And the last thing that I have, I, I call this the scriptural applications in a modern era. You know, I have learned, these are, I'm, I'm using the Apostle Paul for I have learned I have learned that women can change their minds in a fraction of a second. It's way faster than men can adapt, comprehend, or even compensate for. They can have multiple opinions on different subjects and take both sides of an argument and win them. Because of this fact, now we're going to get into scripture. I believe God refers to himself in the masculine. And I am thankful for that truth, because Malachi 3.6 states, For I am the Lord, I change not. <laughs> Pastor's writing that one down. During the COVID crisis, during the COVID crisis, a sign of affection is now considered dangerous. So the kiss has been weaponized and used for evil purposes. This is not a new thing. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was betrayed by a kiss. Right, sir. Now that school's back in session, this is my last one, so you guys could like rest assured. Last one. School's back in session. Teachers are back giving tests and pop quizzes and book reports, and many of them use a red pen to correct, admonish, or even exhort their students. We knew what we got wrong by the red ink. But sometimes a teacher would write a little note of encouragement, said, you did a good job or excellent work. And she'd write it also in that red ink. If you have a red letter edition of your Bible, Jesus' words are written in red. They too are used to correct, to admonish, and even to encourage. Thank you very much. Amen. Paul's little chats are getting better and better. Praise the Lord. All right, we're going to sing one more time together. Probably my favorite chorus. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. So if you would, let's stand again. And we'll sing that together before Brother Ferris comes. Open eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. 
reach out and touch him and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to Let's just do that a cappella. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus to reach out and touch him and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord. And help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I really am looking forward to this evening, 5 o'clock. It's actually afternoon with our Bible study groups and trust that you'll be here for that. I'd like to encourage you to be right here on time. We're going to start here in the auditorium, some special things we're going to do before we break up into our different groups, but uh, something where we're just trying and see how the Lord will use it and trust it will be a blessing to you and will minister to you. Um, so glad to have Brother Ferris with us. Uh, Brother Ferris has been supported by this church now for a number of years. He is a chaplain endorser with All Points Baptist Missions and it's one of my favorite things, I guess, when it comes to our, our work as a church with missionaries, that we are seeing men and women in the military reach with the gospel constantly. And uh, to, Brother Ferris will mention this, I'm sure, before he preaches, but to be able to have men, officers, and the military chaplains that can stand on their faith and preach Jesus Christ openly as an independent fundamental Baptist. It's just amazing. Never thought we'd see that day, but the Lord has allowed that. How long that opens, no one knows. But praise the Lord, that is a possibility now. And there are several men around the country, really around the world, stationed with our troops, preaching the gospel faithfully. And so we're just grateful that Brother Ferris can be here with us. He's not only a missionary, he's an evangelist. He preaches missions conferences and revival meetings, and he's Tremendously effective preacher, and I was really blessed this morning. I don't know what God's laid on his heart for this hour. It might be the same message. I will take a second dose of it. It's like going back for second helpings. I will take it again if that's what the Lord lays in your heart. Uh, something else Brother Ferris does, he sings. Our, our, our uh, special music today uh, is under weather, can't sing this morning. So if God lays on my heart to just belt out a few tunes, you're welcome to do that. And if you don't feel the Lord leading you to do that, you don't have to do that either. But uh, we're grateful to have you here. And, you come on ahead and preach for us this morning. Appreciate you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Vaughn, and thank you, Grace Baptist Church. It's good to be back, see some, some familiar friends. Amen. Good to see some familiar faces. I met young Cohen back there today. We, we've known Miss Sarah since she was, well, quite a bit younger than she is now. Not that she's old. <laughs> But uh, we've known Miss Sarah for a long time and, and uh, watched her grow up and uh, run, run track till she ran out of, everybody out of the state of West Virginia and, and uh, graduate and go to college and, and, and now married to an x-ray tech and, and have a beautiful young man. He, he's not sure about preachers yet, I can tell. I was getting a look this morning, but that's okay. And uh, so we have 10 grandchildren, so we, we always love it when we see little babies like that running around. And Cohen, Cohen looks like he's going to be a Marine. I, I, believe, I believe I can talk him into it. Mama might keep me away from him. I don't know. It's good to be with you all, though. And uh, as your pastor said, uh, in case you don't, some of you may not know me, my, uh, my name is Mike Ferris, my beautiful wife. of going on 40 years now. It's uh, Kim. And uh, we are blessed to be a part of the chaplaincy ministry with All Points Baptist Mission. 
All Points Baptist Mission is a ministry, a local church ministry of the Calvary Baptist Church in New Philadelphia, Ohio. And so we have, uh, and this excites me, if you think about in context of where we are as a country, for the first time in our nation's history, we have the blessing of the United States Department of Defense to, through a local church, send Bible-believing Baptist preachers into the military as chaplains with complete, complete freedom to evangelize and to preach and, and uh, preach the gospel, to counsel according to the word of God. And you pray for these men. They're doing a great work. Uh, we've got uh, one young man in the Middle East right now. Pray for him, Army Captain Dennis Steen. We're praying he'll be home. He's been gone almost a year. Uh, we're praying he'll be home by this time next month. Amen. Uh, we've got a lot of young men that are transitioning um, uh, from one duty station to another. And that's a lot of changes on the family. Uh, new ministry, new house, got to find a new church. Uh, kids taken out of school, going to another school. And uh, it's, very, it's a difficult time on the family and, and in addition to trying to adjust to a new ministry. So pray for these chaplains as they, uh, a lot of them transition. I'd also ask you to pray that God would continue to open the doors to Bible colleges around America. We're excited that we're in seven or eight Bible colleges now, uh, where a few years ago it was difficult for us to even get in three or four around America. Uh, those doors have opened, but we've got several others. Uh, we were going to be in uh, Dr. Treber's school, uh, Golden State, uh, in uh, California last year, but the, the COVID kind of interrupted that, but we have an open invitation there now, and so we're excited. Uh, we believe we're going to be in Commonwealth uh, Baptist College in Kentucky, uh, hopefully before the year's out, if not early next year, and others that we're working on. So pray God would continue to open those doors. That gives us an, a chance to expand the influence of our ministry, and we're looking for young men and women with the call of God on their life to be missionaries. As, as you know, we're a mission agency. We have right now about 50 missionary families on six different continents preaching the gospel. So it's not just about the chaplaincy. That's my side of the house. But uh, it's not just about the chaplaincy. It's about worldwide missions. Amen. Fulfilling the commission to get the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'd ask you to pray about those things and that God would give us safe travel in the many thousands of miles as we travel across America and, and share our ministry with, with others. Well, if you have your Bibles today, and, and, and I struggled really between services because uh, I want to be a blessing, but God, I believe, would have us in Acts chapter 2, uh, not the same message I preached in the morning service. Um, maybe pastor will have me back and we'll flip-flop it, amen? But uh, I believe God would have us in Acts chapter 2 this morning. Pastor's song that he loves, Open Our Eyes, Lord, We Want to See Jesus. A couple of thoughts were going through my mind. One, the church where I got saved in 1984 when I was in the United States Marine Corps at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, is the Emanuel Baptist Church in Swansboro, North Carolina. If you know where that is, it's just about uh, 9 or 10 miles from Camp Lejeune, just east of Camp Lejeune, right on the Atlantic coast there. And uh, the pastor there, Steve Wakefield, the pastor who led me to Christ, is still the pastor there today. I had the honor of preaching his 40th anniversary a few years ago. He'll celebrate this coming August his 44th year. He's getting ready to turn the church over to his nephew, uh, a young man uh, that uh, the church has already accepted into the church. He's gonna, it's going to be a good transition, I believe. Uh, so, but uh, I love Pastor Wakefield. He has a special place. The man who led you to Christ has a special place in your heart. Amen. And uh, so I, I was thinking about that song because the church where I got saved, one of their favorite songs to sing, and I loved it, was, Oh, I Want to See Him. Look upon his face. Have you heard that? You've heard that, haven't you, Pastor? Look upon his face. There to live forever. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Oh, I want to see him. And I think about people like Fanny Crosby, who wrote over 15,000 hymns. Now think about that. I mean, I don't know if I could write one. She wrote over 15,000 hymns in her lifetime, many of which are in her, your, her book. I shall know him, I shall know him. By the print of the nails. And a lady who never saw, by a doctor's mistake from birth, instead of being bitter and suing everybody in the world, Fanny Crosby just decided to write gospel hymns for Christ. Amen. You ought to read her out about the life of Fanny Crosby, blind all of her life, and the first thing she saw when she opened her eyes was Jesus. Open my eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. And I also thought, and, and the Lord's leading me, I, I pray into our text here. I also thought about a series of messages I preach 
that I call 10 unconditional promises in the Bible to the Christian. Now, there are more than 10, a lot more than 10. But to simplify, there are two kinds of promises in the Bible. There are conditional promises, promises that God gives us to which there's a condition attached. A simple one would be, for example, in John 15, where Jesus said, if ye abide in me and my word abide in you, then, if then, that's a condition, right? Then let a man ask what he will, and it shall be done unto him. So there's a condition to getting our prayers answered, amen? Abiding in him and his word abiding in us. But there are also unconditional promises in the Bible to the Christian, only to the Christian. If you're not saved by God's grace, these promises are not for you, but they could be yours. And what I love about unconditional promises is, as a Christian, is there's nothing I can do to ever lose those promises. Back to the song Pastor Loves, what made me think of that was one of those ten unconditional promises is, as a Christian, we have the unconditional promise that one day we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, I want you to think long and hard about that for a minute. Are you kidding me? The God who created the universe and spoke it into existence, the God who took upon him the form of flesh and was made in the likeness of men and born in that stable in Bethlehem, the God who raised folks from the dead and healed the blind and the lame and the sick, the God who had his hands pierced and, and feet and the crown of thorns placed upon his head, that same God, one day we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And what I love that's leading into our text is not just that he died on the cross and was buried, but that he rose again the third day. Isn't that good news? And I know we just celebrated that at Easter time, but as Pastor said earlier this morning, every Sunday when we meet, we meet on Sunday because it's the first day of the week, the day Jesus rose again from the dead. The reason as a Baptist church we meet on Sundays is we're identifying with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I love that. The world doesn't so much mind little baby Jesus in a manger. The world doesn't so mind so much this good man that went about doing good and healing sick people and blind people. The world doesn't mind that so much. The world doesn't even mind the sweetness of a sacrifice and a man giving his life for others on a cross. The world doesn't mind that. You know what hair lips the world? The empty tomb. Because if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then he's alive today. He is who he said he was, the Son of God. And he's coming again. And what he said is true. God has also highly exalted him and given him a name about to shout amen, given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's going to happen. As I have often said, the question as you look around at all the chaos in 2021, the question is not, is God going to get his glory? God is going to get his glory, amen? He said in Numbers chapter 14, as truly as I live, the whole earth shall be filled with my glory. He said in Malachi chapter 1, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. My friend, as you look at what's going on around us, the question today is not, is God going to get his glory? The question is, are you and I going to get in on it? And pardon me if I get a little excited about it. What excites you in 2021? I better get to preaching. Acts chapter 2. I want to be an encouragement to you this morning. And I want to thank you, church, for your part in our ministry. We could not be in this ministry without you. And though we need your financial support to be in the ministry, what we covered is your prayers. You read the scriptures, and I'm not preaching missions conference. You're about to have that in a couple of weeks. But I don't think your pastor would mind me repeating what Paul often said as he reported back to his churches when he said, brethren, pray for us. That's what he said. And he gave you several different things to pray about. In one place, he said that pray that the gospel would have free course. I'd echo that. Pray that we continue to have the free course to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in our military. And praise God we have it. Amen. Pray that God would keep us from unruly and, and, and the deceitful men and, and wicked men. Pray that God would keep And Paul gave specific requests 
for which the church should pray for him. In Acts chapter 2, though, we come to a passage of Scripture I pray will be an encouragement to your heart today. And you'll have to pardon me because I can't read these words without getting truly excited. And it don't take much to excite me. Maybe you figured that out already. Jesus has died, was buried, and rose again the third day, roughly seven weeks from the time Peter's preaching this message in Acts chapter 2. And we come down to verse number 22 of Acts chapter 2. And if you have that, we're just going to read three verses. I'm going to ask you if you're able to stand in order to honor the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. We'll take just a few minutes to give you the backdrop and then get right into the message. Peter's preaching here, Acts 2, verse 22. He says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him, we're still talking about Jesus Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Whom, we're still talking about Jesus Christ, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. I suppose verse 24 of Acts chapter 2 is one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. There's so much there to be impossible to preach it in one message today, but I want to give you a couple of thoughts I pray will be a help and maybe a challenge to you this morning, if you, if you will. Verse 24, whom God hath raised up, and look at, look at the two things here I want to focus on in this verse for now. Having loosed the pains of death. Think about that in light of the past year that we've been through together as a nation, yea, as an area. Having loosed the pains of death, and I love this, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Jesus has loosed the pains of death. And it wasn't even possible for death to hold him. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your mission on earth. You said, Lord, that you came to seek and to save that which was lost. And Lord, the mission that you have given us as the church, the local church, is to go out and to seek and to save that which is lost. Tell them about Jesus. Simply tell them the gospel. That's all we do. That Jesus, who is God, shed his perfect, sinless, spotless blood on the cross, just as was pictured in the Passover lamb, paid the price for sin forever and ever. He was buried and rose again from the dead on the third day. And now you live and are seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us even now. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now, Lord, in these few minutes together, I pray you'd help and encourage the hearts of these thy people, save the lost, and I pray if there's anyone here today that's discouraged, that you might uplift their heart and encourage them for the battles to come. And may Jesus Christ alone be glorified, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. Now, I want to take just a few minutes to give you the backdrop of where we are here because it'll, it'll help to grasp, I think, the message that we have today. But you're going to find that we're here in Jerusalem, the same city where Jesus was crucified outside the gate roughly seven weeks before this very event. The famous sermon, as the name has been given, Peter's Pentecost sermon, his sermon at Pentecost, if you will. Pentecost meaning 50 50 days. And of course, Jesus in chapter 1 has ascended and gone back into heaven. And just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave us one more time the commission he'd already given to his disciples to go ye therefore. When he said, literally, I believe, as he was beginning to levitate off the earth, and as the disciples and the multitudes gathered round, can you picture them watching him with gaping eyes and mouths hanging open like, I've never seen anybody do this before. And he said unto them, Ye shall receive power 
after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, for what purpose? That ye may be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. It was the promise Jesus gave them that they would receive the Holy Spirit. Fast forward now to chapter 2. We're now in chapter 2. The disciples have replaced the deceiver and the, uh, uh, the one who... Uh, 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 hard to believe what he did. To trespass against the Lord the way that he did, as was already said with a kiss, betray the Lord of heaven. And they've replaced him with Matthias. And in chapter 2, we find the disciples are all gathered together, I believe, having a prayer meeting. And the Bible says they heard a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. And we know that the promise that God gave of the Holy Spirit is coming upon them. And the Bible says that multitudes in Acts chapter 2 have gathered together in Jerusalem. Literally, we find from all over the world. There were Libyans there. There were Arabians there. There were Asians there. There were people there from Cappadocia, which is modern-day Turkey. There were Parthians there, which were from what we would call modern-day Iraq and Iran. There were people there from Egypt, Jews scattered from Judea and Galilee, and uh, from Rome, Mesopotamians, from all over the world. People were there in Jerusalem. And something is happening that the Bible says has confounded the people as the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples. The Bible says they were confounded. That means they were astonished, perplexed. It's almost as though you and I were part of the crowd and we're there and we see something, we say to each other, well, what's going on? As if to say, amen? They were confounded, astonished by what's happening. Now what's taking place? The disciples are gathered in one place in Jerusalem and all of a sudden as the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they began to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in all of the other languages represented by the people who were there. All of a sudden, these men who had never taken Greek or Hebrew, these men who had never learned Japanese, these men who had never learned Italian, all of a sudden are able to speak in all of these different languages, Parthian, Cappadocian, Egyptian, they're able to speak in other languages preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, having never learned those languages. That's a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost that Jesus Christ promised would come upon them. Now, this is exciting to the Christian. To the rest of the world, they're standing around saying, what's going on? Now, I want you to go back with me just a second. Now, watch this, because I love how God puts this together. Remember, just before Jesus is crucified, he's talking to his disciples. And Jesus said something that if you and I were the disciples, we would have been as discouraged as they were. Jesus said in John 16, Get a little while am I with you, and then ye shall not see me. And then you'll see me again. And the disciples began to be confused. What is this he says? To, where's he going? Get a little while he's with us and we won't see. What, what is he talking about? And then Jesus later says this. Imagine Jesus saying this to his disciples who have walked with him for three and a half years. Jesus says for, to his disciples, It is expedient for you that I go away. If I'm the disciples, I'm saying, what? We've watched you heal the sick and raise the dead and heal the blind. We were there when you said, Lazarus, and Lazarus gets up and walks up. We've seen all that. We've learned from you, and we've loved you. We know you're the Son of God, and it's expedient for us. It's good for us you leave. What are you talking about? And I can understand the disciples' confusion, but Jesus said, I will pray the Father, and he will send you another comforter, now, this is what I love about what he said, that he may abide with you forever. Jesus said, I'm going away. It was necessary for Jesus to complete his mission, to go to the cross, to shed his blood, to make salvation possible for you and I, to die on that cross, be buried for three days, and bodily raise up from the dead. It was necessary for him to fill that, fulfill that mission and to go back home to be with his father seated at the right hand. Amen? And we find the fulfillment of Jesus' very promise right here in Acts chapter 2. No wonder the disciples are excited, but the rest of the world is astonished. 
They're perplexed. They're confounded. What's going on? How is it that these men speak in other languages? And in the context of the scripture, if you read Acts chapter 2, you'll find the multitudes thought, oh, these guys are drunk. That's what's happening. I think these disciples partied a little too long last night down there at Grace Baptist Church. And I think they put something in that communion table besides Welch's grape juice. Say, man, these guys, <laughs> there's something wrong with them this morning. They're a little too high for my liking. And that's what it says. That's what the scripture said. Look at it with me. Some of you look at me like you don't believe me, like a dying calf in a hailstorm. Amen? Watch this. Look, look at verse 12. Acts 2, verse 12. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are all full of new wine. But look at verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. And the rest of chapter 2, Peter says, let me explain to you what's going on here, boys. Amen? And Peter begins to preach unto them Jesus. That's what's happening here. That's the backdrop. The promise of Jesus has arrived. Go back with me to verse number 6 because I want you to see these verses to get the context. They're speaking in these other languages, the gospel of Jesus Christ, verse 6, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? How is it that these things are happening? I'll tell you how. When the Holy Spirit gets in, brother, things get stirred. Anytime you find the Holy Spirit in the Bible, you find movement. And boy, do we need movement among God's people in 2021. When you find creation, the Holy Spirit is there. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, uh, face of the waters, uh, face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And brother, that's when creation started. When the Holy Spirit moves, something's fixing to happen. How we get the Bible? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Are you with me, church? What we need in 2021 is not the right man in the right White House. It's the right spirit in the church house. I hope today is not on Capitol Hill. I hope today is on Calvary's Hill. He has gotten up from the dead, loosed us from the pains of death because it were not possible that death should be holding from him. Now watch it. Peter clarifies. Look at verse 14. Look, We saw verse 14. Look at verse 15. These are not drunken, as you supposed, seeing it's about the third hour of the day. Peter said, hey, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. And we're having a good time, but it's not because of the wine. It's because Jesus left, and we were sad about that, but he told us he was going to send us another comforter, and he's arrived. And the reason we're able to speak in all these other languages and preach unto you the gospel in tongues that we've never learned before is because the Holy Spirit has moved upon our hearts. Are you with me, church? And he begins to preach Jesus to the multitude, and that brings us to our text in verse 22. Now, I want you to see three things this morning very quickly. Number one, I want you to see the revelation and proof of Christ's deity. The revelation and proof of Christ's deity. Boy, do we need, do we need a, a revival of this in America in 2021? Too many today, and I see it in our military, and I, I see it prevalent in our society. I'm afraid I even see it in a lot of our church pews across America, amen, is that we've gotten this idea that Jesus was a wonderful man, and he went about doing good works, and oh my, he sacrificed himself on the cross. Everybody believes Jesus died on the cross, amen. May I say to you, the devils believe and tremble. There needs to be something more than just a head knowledge. There needs to be a persuasion that reaches clear down to your heart. See, that's what repentance is. Repentance is a change of heart which results in a change of direction. We're living in a day and age when this modern Christianity, and I've about had it up to here with it, amen, comes along and says you can live any way you want to and call yourself a Christian, and as long as you call yourself a Christian, you're all right with God. That's contrary to the Word of God. Now listen to me, friend, this morning. You can come to Jesus Christ just as you are, but you will not leave just as you were. You cannot come to Jesus Christ and then go back and live any way you want to live and say, as long as I believe in Jesus, everything's all right. That's contrary to the Word of God. 
something has happened. Jesus Christ isn't a good man that just went about doing good works. May I say to you emphatically this morning, Jesus Christ is God. There never was a time when there wasn't Jesus Christ. And there never will be a time when there wasn't Jesus Christ. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. The Bible says in the beginning, John chapter 1 was the Word. That's a capital W. That's a direct reference to Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things, how many things? All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The Bible says not only did He make all things, Colossians chapter 1, but by Him all things consist. Jesus Christ is literally the glue that holds the molecules of the universe together. He is God. It's the message Peter's trying to get across here. Now, I want you to look first of all at verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. They knew Jesus was who he said he was. Can I say to you, the Pharisees knew Jesus was who he said he was. Can I put it to you this way? Pilate knew Jesus was who he said it was. Three times he went before the Jews and said, I find no fault in this man. When Pilate washed his hands in that water, symbolic of somehow washing his hands of any responsibility for the death of Jesus Christ, I'm afraid he made a fatal mistake, amen? But when he washed his hands in that water, he said, I wash my hands of any guilt of this just person. Pilate's wife said, have nothing to do with this just man. She knew he was God. You with me, church? And the world does too. They just don't want to own up to the fact that he's risen again and one day they're going to have to bow for him. And we all will. Let me say that again. We all will. Now, the revelation and proof of his deity. Now, I love this. Peter declares that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But the people knew it, as he said. First of all, he's preaching. He said, ye men of Israel. He's talking now just to the Jews. Let me explain to you why we're speaking in Italian and Asian here, all right? Because the Jews are trying to figure out what's going on, too. What's going on here? And he said, first of all, we have Old Testament prophecy. I mean, you could go back to Genesis chapter 22, and when, when Abraham was about to sacrifice his son Isaac, remember Isaac was talking to his father and said, Dad, I see the wood and I see the fire, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And what did Abraham say that was a prophecy of Jesus Christ himself to come? Son God will provide himself a sacrifice, and he did in Jesus Christ. And on and on we could go. We could spend all morning long, your pastor could, telling you about all the Old Testament prophecies. How about that uh, Exodus chapter 12 and that Passover lamb? That he was to be a male without blemish of the first year. Amen? A picture of the spotless lamb of God that was to come. And that Blood was to be placed on the doorpost and on the lintel, a representation of the perfect blood of Jesus Christ that would one day be shed on the cross. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. My, son, my friend, may I say to you this morning, if you have not trusted in the shed blood of Jesus Christ to pay for your sins, you are yet in your sins. You will not go to heaven when you die. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how much you've attended church. Hey, listen, coming to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you an F-150 pickup truck. Amen? Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a greenhouse makes you a gardenia. There must be a transformation. Jesus said you must be born again. And you're born again because the Holy Spirit of God draws you. The Holy Spirit's job, not my job. My job is just to preach the message. You don't get saved because of the preacher. You get saved because hopefully the preacher preaches the truth of the Word of God, who the Holy Spirit inspired, and that Word penetrates your heart, and the goodness of God leads you to repentance, and the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Your sin, 
Jesus Christ's righteousness and the judgment of Almighty God. And they're certain, for it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, my friend, the judgment. Now, Old Testament prophecy. Listen, Isaiah chapter 53 prophesied of his crucifixion. In Micah chapter 5, we find the Old Testament prophecy that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Everything, all the Old Testament prophecies were all pointing to Jesus Christ. Number two, we have the Old Testament portraits. The Old Testament portraits. Did you know everything in the Old Testament is just a picture of Jesus Christ? Everything. How about the tabernacle? It's a picture of Jesus Christ. The table of showbread on the north side of that holy place. The table of showbread was a picture of Jesus Christ who is the bread of life. What about the candlestick on the south side of the holy place? Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Are you with me, church? Why is there only one door in the tabernacle? Because Jesus Christ said, I am the door. Any man who tries to climb up any other way is a thief and a robber. Can I say to you, friend, all of the Old Testament portraits paint a picture of Jesus Christ. We have the prophecy, the Old Testament prophecy. We have the Old Testament portraits. He has the pedigree. Jesus has the pedigree. His lineage is given in two different places in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 1, we have Jesus' lineage through Joseph. We have the royal line of Jesus Christ showing that he is the royal heir to the throne from Joseph back to David. Remember, the promise was made to David that he would take David's throne forever and ever. Not only does he have the royal line, but he also has the legal line. For if you go over to Luke chapter 3, you will find Mary, will find her lineage all the way back to Adam. All the way back to Adam. There's only one man who's ever lived. Only one man, listen to this preacher, who's ever lived, whose pedigree proves he is who he said he is, that's traced all the way back to the first man, Adam, and that's Jesus Christ. He has the prophecy, there's the portraits, there was the pedigree. Now watch this, it gets more fun. There was the preaching. John the Baptist preached, he that comes after me is preferred before me. <laughs> Whose shoes latch it, I'm not even worthy to unloose. It was John the Baptist who preached, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. There was the preaching that proved Jesus was who he said he was. There was the proof. He says in verse 22 there, approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you. They saw him cast out devils. The people themselves said, what a word with it is this, for with authority he speaks and the devils are cast out. They witnessed it. They saw him raise the dead. They were there when that lady of Nain in Luke chapter 7 who had lost her husband now has lost her son, and in those days, that was her only means of support left. She'd lost, besides losing her husband and the heartbreak of losing her son, she's lost her support. And the city's rallying around her, and the entire city, that little town of Nain, gets together, and I love it. you got a funeral procession coming this way, and Jesus coming this way, and dead can never stay dead in the presence of Jesus. Something interesting's about to happen. Well, you know what happened. Jesus touched that coffin, and that boy sat up. <laughs> and I've often pictured that with hilarity. <laughs> Can you imagine the pallbearers? <laughs> I picture that boy saying, saying this when he woke up, where am I? And then right after that, he says, oh, because they dropped him that was carrying him, amen? <laughs> yep, ain't never seen me get it from a casket before. No, you're on your own, boy. <laughs> Dead can't stay dead in the presence of Jesus. It's not possible for death to hold back Jesus Christ. Now hold on, it gets better. There was the proof. There was the praise. Remember when he healed blind Bartimaeus? The Bible says and when they all saw it, they gave praise unto God. Wasn't it the people just a few days before he was crucified that put down their clothes and palm branches and said, Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. That word Hosanna means save us. The Jews will say that again when they see him at his second coming and he plants his feet on the Mount of Olives when they repeat that Jewish phrase, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, which is to say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus Christ comes again and sets his feet on the Mount of Olives and rules and reigns for a thousand years on this earth. 
Jesus Christ. There was the proof. And then lastly, there was the promise. He promised the Holy Spirit, now the Holy Spirit's arrived. As ye yourselves know, Peter said. Later, Paul said it this way when he was testifying as he was in bonds before Herod. He said, I know you know that these things were not done in a corner. Everybody knows Jesus Christ is who he said he is. And so Peter is preaching, and number one, we have the revelation and proof of his deity. May I say to you, friend, you need to grasp the reality that Jesus Christ is God. The only reason that you can be saved, you and I can be saved, and ever have the hope of heaven, is not because of one good thing you and I have ever done. On our best day, I said on our best day, we can never measure up. All men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only way you're going to get to heaven, God's always required blood for the atonement. Read, read Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 sometime. Without the shedding of blood, there's no atonement. And Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And that perfect lamb shed his perfect blood that day on Calvary. And when he rose again from the dead, he took that blood and sprinkled it on the heavenly mercy seat, not made with hands. And God, the supreme judge of the universe, looked down at that blood and he said, I'm satisfied. There's no more need for sacrifice. Once and for all, the issue's been settled in the shed blood. And Peter here is preaching on the revelation and proof of Christ's deity. Now that's just to set you up for what I hope is dessert to come. Number two, Peter preaches that Christ has released us from the pains of death. In verse 24, whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death. Now as I quoted already, and you know, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. I suppose if you were to take all of man's fears down through history, as I read books, Pastor, and I understand it, I would have to say, and most of us would probably agree, that the greatest fear man has ever had is death. Most of us have never experienced death yet. Amen? Because once you're dead, you don't come back. You're there in the grave. Your jaw is locked. Isaiah chapter 38 says you cannot give praise any longer. That's why I get excited and shout the way I do now. Some people say, Brother Ferris, why do you get so excited about the things of God? Because the Bible says the dead cannot praise God. And I want to get my licks in when I got the chance, brother. When Jesus was coming down into Jerusalem, the, the people were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were giving him praise to the Lord. You know what the Pharisees said? I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Pharisees, Pharisees told Jesus, why don't you tell these people to shut up? That's what they told him. These people are socially intolerant and they're causing a riot in the modern vernacular. Amen? I mean, why don't you just tell these people to shut up? You know what Jesus said? I tell you, if these praise me not, the rocks would cry out. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to get beat by a bunch of dumb rocks. Amen? Amen. I just soon get my shouts in while I still got breath to do. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. I think we heard that verse sometime earlier today. Released us from the pains of death. Now, let's ask this question very quick, quickly. Why death? Why death? Simple answer, sin. Wherefore, Romans chapter 5, wherefore is by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. And death because of sin, right? And death has passed upon all men because why? All have sinned. Just as sure as I'm standing here, if the Lord tarries this coming, you and I will go by way of the grave. You can disprove evolution with a coffin, a shovel, and a pile of dirt. Amen? Yes, you can. And he's released us from the pains of death. So we know the why death, but what are some of the pains of death? Now, there are too many to list, but let me just give you a couple very quickly. The fear of death is just the fear of the unknown itself. As I said, we've not experienced death. Is it, is it a painful thing? None of us have just gone out into that eternity. I like how my pastor likens it, Pastor Heitman. He, he talks about like going through the shadow of a tree. It's kind of like you pass under the shadow of a tree and then you come out the other side of a shadow. That's probably about as good a likeness as I've heard, amen? But we, there's still the fear of that unknown. How about the pains of the sorrow of death? I can assure you right now, my neighbor across the street is in sorrow this morning. That was his mama. 
And my wife and I knew this lady, and we knew her to be a wonderful lady, not just a wonderful Christian lady, just a wonderful lady, period, amen? She uh, uh, was true to her kids. She was true to the, her faith in Jesus Christ. She was a hardworking lady. Steve's wife, who never had much of a childhood and never had much, much of a mother of her own, calls this lady her own mother. She never had a mother like this lady before. And they're naturally, because we're human beings, of course they're in sorrow today. It's natural for you and I to grieve at the death of our loved ones. Pastor Vaughn was there. He was with me a couple of months ago when we sat and watched our good friend John Freeman say goodbye to his wife who passed away at a young age and unexpectedly. Amen. And all we could do, as the Bible says, was weep with those that weep. That's all we could do. What can you say to Brother John? I can't tell him. I know how he feels. I still have my wife. Amen. And praise God, I, I don't know that I could endure what Brother John's had to endure, but he's in the pulpit today. I love, I love Brother Freeman. And I love his faithfulness and his kindness to me has is, 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 is been a help to me over the years. But what I'm saying to you, friend, is Christ has loosed us from the pains of death. We need not sow at the grave as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even also, even also those that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And then Paul said, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, there's a thing we can do to prevent the dead from raising again. <laughs> I love it. For the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Isn't that going to be a sight? Sweetheart, what's your grandma? She died in 2001. What's she doing floating up yonder in the air? <laughs> Didn't you hear the trumpet, sweetheart? Amen. We're fixing to leave this place. He's conquered the sorrow of death. David said in Psalms 18, 4, the sorrows of death have come past me. Doubtless all of us in this room can point to a time when you were at the grave of a friend or a loved one, someone so dear that it broke your heart to say goodbye. And it's not goodbye. When my daddy passed away in 2008, I loved my daddy with all of my heart. He was a good daddy. And as my wife was there with me in Arkansas at that at that Veterans Memorial Cemetery there where he's buried, Springdale, Arkansas. And the casket was there. And I was seated as a, as a family member at the front row and my dear wife holding my hand. I determined in my heart that when they went by the casket for the last time that I would not linger. I knew that was just a shell there. That wasn't daddy. That was just the shell that held my daddy. Amen. And I determined, Pastor, that I would not linger at the casket. And I said, Lord, just... You just tell me what to say, and I'll just say it and go. So as I walked by the casket, my heart was warmed. As I looked at that face that was once my daddy on this earth, and I said, see you soon, daddy. How do you know that? Because Jesus Christ has loosed the pains of death. And one day I'll see my daddy again. Just like Steve Kramer, if he'll get saved, we'll see his mama again. And those of you seated across this auditorium, Dallas, have loved ones that you know are in heaven today, and you're excited and rejoiced. And all of that's going to happen, not because of anything we've ever done, but because Jesus loosed the pains of death. That's something worth getting excited about in 2021. And you won't find it on the 11 o'clock news. You're going to have to get in the book. The fear of the unknown, the sorrow. How about the finality? The silence in the grave. As I said in Isaiah 38, the Bible says you can't give praise in the grave. Jesus has set the captive free. Ephesians 4 says, But unto every one of us is grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Jesus Christ has loosed the pains of death. Yes, in our flesh we're still going to sorrow. That's natural. We still have the mortality of this flesh, but one day because Jesus rose again, this mortal will put on immortality. And this corruption, listen to me, Christian, this corruption shall put on incorruption. 
There'll be no more sickness. Jesus said there'll be no more death. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain. All tears shall be wiped away for the former things Jesus said are passed away. Now, I don't know about you, but that excites me even in 2021 in the midst of where we're living now. The revelation of the deity of Christ, amen, is wonderful. But the revealed proof of his resurrection and then lastly, resurrected by his power over death. Now, I want you to see this. In verse 24 of our text, it says it was not possible that he should be holding of it. It's not possible. The death of our Jesus Christ, you can almost picture Satan. Every time I get close to this pulpit, I think, I feel, Pastor, you need to get a uh, fire extinguisher and put it here. Because I'm quite sure when that lady was playing the piano, I saw some smoke coming off them keys, brother. That was good stuff. Was your heart blessed like mine? Every time I get close to that, I feel like I feel heat coming from that piano. Whew, that's some piano playing. Thank you, Lord, for that. Hey, listen to me. Death is powerless with he who gave life. Jesus said in John chapter 6, listen to what he said. He said, the flesh profiteth nothing. Can I say it to you this way, friend? You can sprinkle spoofle dust all over this thing. You can paint it. You can massage it. You can dye your hair. You can do whatever you want to do. And a thing you can ever do that this flesh and blood's ever going to enter the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood can't do it. Not going to get there. You're going to have to go through death and this flesh goes back to worm food and your spirit and your soul go to be with God forever. Or this robe of flesh, you'll drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize when Jesus blows that trumpet. Amen. The resurrection. I like what Jesus said, though. And this is what I'm getting at as I wrap this up. Jesus said in John chapter 10, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Did you hear what he said? In the next verse, Jesus even took it a step further. He said, No man taketh it from me. I have power to lay it down, and I have power, are you getting happy yet? And I have power to take it up again. Satan thought he'd won the war. Amen? Jesus is crucified and he's in that grave. Can I say to you, even the disciples didn't expect him to get up. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who had gotten saved back in John chapter 3, I believe that, they, they begged the body of Jesus from Pilate and they got his body down off the cross and they began to embalm him, the Bible says, as was the manner of the Jews. And they took those myrrh and those aloes and those spices and they took strips of cloth and they dipped it in those spices and wrapped him from head to toe like you wrap a mummy. Because even though they knew Jesus was who he said he was, they wasn't expecting Jesus to get up from the dead. Neither did the two women who showed up at the tomb that morning as they showed up with spices expecting Jesus' body to be there. And when they saw the stone rolled away, <laughs> they thought somebody took his body. But the angels got it straight for him, didn't he? Fear not. He's not here. <laughs> for he has risen as he said. Why? Because it wasn't possible for death to hold him. It wasn't possible. How do I know I'm going to heaven when I die? Because Jesus Christ, my Savior, it's not possible that death can hold my spirit and my soul to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. I'm not saying that makes death easy for us. I'm saying Jesus has loosed the pains of death. And because of that, we can rejoice in our future. Did it ever occur to you that Jesus never preached a funeral? That's why the Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath begotten us again unto a lively hope, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What about you? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that any man that doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is an antichrist. Am I right about that, Pastor? I'm saying to you, my friend, 
what has happened with all of the noise of the past year is we have gotten so consumed with all kinds of noise and everything that's going on, the political upheaval, the social upheaval, COVID, which is real, amen? Just ask our neighbor across the street who's burying their mother this morning, Pastor Freeman's wife I mentioned in Dallas, you all know people, amen? It's real, we know it's real. And all of that, if you're not careful, will discourage you, my friend. But be not discouraged. The same Holy Spirit that spoke the worlds into existence, the same Holy Spirit that caused these disciples to speak in other languages, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and by the way, 3,000 souls were saved that day. Not bad, huh? Not bad for a guy who hadn't preached very many messages. Peter did all right because the Holy Spirit showed up. That same Holy Spirit is still Holy Spirit today. And if you are here, Christian friend, my, point, my whole point is wrapped up in this. If you are here and you're saved by God's grace, then God the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Listen, the moment I got saved, I did not know all that happened to me. All I knew was I wasn't going to hell when I died. And by the way, that's not a bad reason to get saved. That's all. I couldn't get up in front of the church at the moment I got saved in 1984 and testify to you that I understood the doctrine of the entrance of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit upon my life. I couldn't have explained that to you. Didn't understand it, didn't care. I just knew Jesus had washed away my sins by his blood. But may I say to you, church, if you are saved, you have what the world doesn't have. That's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. Just as much God as Jesus Christ himself. Amen. And the Holy Spirit, unlike Jesus who of necessity had to leave, the Holy Spirit will never leave you nor forsake you. There will never be a second of your life, child of God, when you'll be without the Holy Spirit in your worst trial, in your greatest difficulty. He's there. In your greatest triumphs, he's there. When you're on your knees and you don't even know what to pray, he's there only, uh, muttering gro groanings that you don't even understand, interceding for you and I. Isn't God wonderful? Isn't he amazing? Having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. My friend, if you're here today and you're not saved by God's grace, when you die... Your flesh, just like my flesh, will go back to worm food. But your soul and your spirit whom God made will live forever. It'll live forever in one of two places. It'll either live in a real place that burns with fire called hell. And it has nothing to do with whether you are a good person or a bad person. The other possibility is heaven. Where you live in eternal bliss and walk on streets that are gold, like transparent, like glass. Walls of jasper and gates of pearl. Drink from the river of life and live through all eternity. Where there's no need for the sun, for the Lamb of God is the light thereof. <laughs> so what determines that, Brother Ferris? What you do with Jesus Christ? You see, as I close, friend, the Bible says in John chapter 3 that the Father loveth the Son and hath put all things into his hand. One day, you and I, everybody in this room, everybody who's walking and breathing on this earth, whoever has, will stand before Jesus Christ, thus saith the Lord. And he'll either say to you, enter thou into the joy of my Lord, or he'll say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now listen to what he says. I never knew you. Everybody tells me they know Jesus. But the question this morning is, does he know you? Nahum 1.7 says that the Lord knoweth them that trust in him. I'm asking you this morning to take a serious look. God's done everything that's necessary to buy your pardon and to loose you from the pains of death and to take you to heaven when you die. And the only thing that will keep you from it is rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not about how good a life you live. 
I've said this as I close, Pastor, and this horrifies me. If this speaks to your soul, you better do business with God. But it horrifies me to know that there are thousands sitting across the pews of churches like this one in America this morning who are going to one day lift up their eyes in hell and say, why am I here? I was in church. I gave money to missions. I sang in the choir. I taught a Sunday school class. I, 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 and I is not the answer. Jesus Christ has loosed the pains of death. And only trusting in his finished gospel, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, will you ever see heaven. How about it, friend? Christian friend, if you're saved by God's grace, that means you're full of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what that means? The Holy Spirit is a procreator. Constantly in the Bible, I can prove this to you, all the Holy Spirit ever does is produce more life. In other words, it's your job and mine to produce more fruit. Herein is my Father glorified in that ye bear much fruit. Even the grass and the trees are commanded. And the Lord God said in Genesis chapter 1, that the earth shall bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. There's no horse cows. There's no mosquito chickens. Okay? Forget the evolutionist knuckleheads. Are you with me, church? Everything after his kind, whose seed is in itself. And it was so upon the earth. Just as God told the trees and the grass and the plants and the fruits to reproduce. And by the way, 6,000 years later, I look outside and it looks like the trees and grass are still obeying God. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, You've not chosen me, but I have chosen you that ye should go and bring forth fruit. Amen? The seed of the Holy Spirit is inside of you. The seed which gave Jesus Christ life, that dead body, is the same seed that lives in you. Are you sharing it with others? The message is for both the lost and the saved today. What will you do with what God has said unto you? Do you realize what God has done for you, loosing the pains of death? And do you realize what he can do for others through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Heavenly Father, how I thank you for Grace Baptist Church, Pastor Vaughn. I thank you, Lord, for this day that you have given us. And Lord, it was not eloquent. There are others that would be much more articulate than I. But Lord, I believe I've been obedient to preach what you'd have me to preach today. Now I'm asking you, Lord, to stir hearts and do that which only you can do. Lives in this congregation are at stake. Not only souls, Lord, that may be lost, but even the lives of those who are here and know they're saved by God's grace, but know they need to do more to help others have the pains of death loose from them by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please, Lord, do that which only you can do in this hour. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Pastor Vaughn. Just stand with your heads bowed, please. Heads bowed and eyes closed. And just ask this question. I I look across the auditorium this morning, and it looks like everyone who is here is just part of our church family. But I found this over the years, and you know this to be true yourself, that there are times people can sit in a pew for years and never have personally put their trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior and never truly turn from their sin and put their trust alone in Him. We've seen that here in this church. And if you don't know Him today, this would be a great day to make that choice and put your trust in Him. Let Him be your Savior. And if you don't know Him today, if you're not confident of that, God wants you to be confident of that. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life in you. If you're not confident, would you come this morning and would you allow him to become your Savior? Secondly, you know, I'm glad we heard preaching about the resurrection today because it's still Resurrection Sunday. We're still celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we'll do so every Sunday that we meet. 
maybe this morning as a believer, you just want to come and say, Lord, thank you that death could not hold you. And because of that, it can't hold me either. And I don't have to grieve like other people grieve. I don't have to sorrow like other people sorrow. Maybe you'd just like to come and kneel at this altar or come to this altar and just thank the Lord for that. Maybe there's a need to recommit yourself to him, to live for him. Maybe you're not living for him like you should, but whatever the need is. And so we're going to keep our heads bowed. And I know Miss Patty had to slip out. So we're just going to, oh, Patty is here right there. So let's just sing that verse together. Have thine own way, Lord. And if you need to come this morning, you come. Have thine own way. is clear this morning and if not as I mentioned last week God's dealt with you and you didn't come to the altar this morning then right after the service there might be somebody seated right beside you that could help you or talk to me talk to one of our folks we want you to make sure that you know Christ second we want you to know that you're right with him and if you are born again that you're living for him it doesn't do us any good to come here and play games it really doesn't it doesn't do us any good to hear truth and then let it just fall to the ground uh, I, I almost wish you'd have been here for the first service so you could hear both services today. So I've had my cup filled twice, and it really was a tremendous service message this morning. So I'm glad you're here, and I hope you will be back at 5 tonight. I really do. And looking forward, uh, you know, COVID's messed us all up. There's no doubt about it. Like every other church, it has had a great effect on Grace Baptist. And we're trying to get back to a normal. And that's why we're going to have VBS this this year, we're getting our van ministry started back, trying to do some things, get back to normal, and uh, like many other churches. And so one of those things, and it's so important to have, you know, what we used to call Sunday school, the small groups where we meet together and uh, just get some very direct instruction. So we're going to meet here in the auditorium at 5 o'clock, and then we'll be going to the different buildings, you know, for our different classes. So I trust that you'll be here tonight at 5 if you're able to be here. And so if you're not able to be here for that for some reason, would you pray for it? Would you pray that God would use it and just, uh, you know, see God do good work through that? Well, let's go ahead and we'll bow for prayer. And Harold, I'm going to have you close us in prayer this morning, if you would, please.